Hello, welcome. Uh, my name is Richie Bellinger. I took my first clay class in uh, one of my students from Rock Creek. Um, I took my my first clay class in Wheat at Wheat North High School in 1972. So that makes it 50 years I've been doing this, and I've had the good fortune of making a living one way or another, working with clay. And um, I'm going to show you just one of the fun things I've been doing here, uh, a technique you might want to try if you do clay or something that might interest you just in general. Uh, please uh, shout out any questions. Don't be shy about that. It's better than me doing a monologue, uh, although I'll, I'll do my best monologue ever. So I'm going to start out, I usually start out in the studio with s making some small things just to warm up my wrists. Uh, so I'm going to start by making a mug. I love making mugs. Uh, I usually use about a pound of clay. I don't measure. I just kind of grab a ball of clay here and there and just start making things. I've, been, I've made probably, uh, I don't know, five, 6,000 mugs over my career. And I'm not tired of it. They're just fun to make. Um, I'm using the Mount Hood porcelain, for those who might be interested, that's uh, Georgie's Ceramic Clay Company. I fired a cone 10, I've got a couple samples here, um, but I'm going to go ahead and see how this wheel works. I'm going to be learning how to use this microphone. Uh, there we go. Try a different bat. That'll work. A little water on there helps the, uh, the clay to stick. Now I normally in my studio I work standing up. So I have my wheel up on a table. It's a lot easier on my back. Um, but I think I remember how to do this. Usually my water is right here, I think. Let's try this. Uh, I don't know. We'll, we'll make it work. Of course, if you've tried uh, working on the potter's wheel, you know the first thing you have to learn how to do is get the clay centered. So I start by making that ball of clay real round, but then... I'm going to move it up and down, and that helps me facilitate the centering. And I'm keeping moisture on the surface. Oops, that's going to take some getting used to that. Can't lean on the splash pan. <laughs> I call this drawing the bullseye. I just like to visually know where the center is. It doesn't help you much if you center your clay and then the hole you open is not in the center. Then it's really a mess. When I was learning, I used my pin tool To, to, to test and determine how thick that clay is in the bottom. You do it enough times and you, you, get, you develop the sensitivity to feel the resistance of the board underneath there. So I don't, I don't need to do that, but that's important when you're learning. So I found the depth. I'm gonna open the bottom. And then I call this knitting the clay back together. When I opened the bottom, I tore the clay a little bit. And so I, I, I go from the outside back to the middle to compress that clay and I get a lot less cracking. Now I'm ready to do the pulls. 
first one I just establish uh, what I call a truncated cone. It's just leaning in a little bit. Now the goal is just to gradually thin the wall, pull up the clay. I remember the first time I saw somebody do this and I, I thought this part was magical just to see that piece grow and and I still still get a little bit of that feeling even though I've done it many times. During the first year of the pandemic when we were all kind of locked down, I spent time in the studio because it helped me get feel grounded just doing something with my hands and something I I was good at, I thought. This is a fingertip pull. I'm making a mug and I want the mug to be light so it's fun to use. So I'm going to do one more pull. Notice I'm setting the rim. I want that rim to be solid and, but not sharp. Now I'm noticing I have a just a little bulge of clay down there. I didn't plan that, it's, but I'm going to use it. Uh, now I'm liking that the the thinness of the walls now. Now because I'm going to add texture on the surface using slip, I want to get the throwing marks off of there. So you see those throwing marks. They're pretty nice. Uh, and they sometimes I leave them plain like that, but I usually take I rib them off with this flexible metal rib. This clay is 13-14% shrinkage. So yeah, I still make a bunch of mugs that are too small because I make them oversized and they shrink a lot. Porcelain clay shrinks a little bit more than stoneware. Now I mentioned that clay at the bottom. I'm going to run this rib down and use this edge to create Just a little lip down there. It's just an element of form that I'm going to leave. And I'm just cutting away a lot of the extra clay. Save me time later when I, you know, I'm going to flip this over when it's leather hard and trim the extra clay off the bottom, but I can save a lot of time because I can do that real quickly right there. Now I've got a sharp edge down there. I don't want that. Soften that up with a sponge. And that creates a little place to catch the glaze because I use a lot of runny glazes. Now, in this bucket here I have a, a bucket of slip it's white clay, but it's it's mixed up like maybe uh, melted ice cream or heavy cream or yogurt, somewhere in that area. Uh, I just want to get a lot of this slip onto the surface here as quickly as possible. So I've I've learned to use a syringe to do that. I don't want to tell you how many years I did it like this. Refilling the brush before I figured this little thing out. Uh, so I'm squirting it on the brush.
The question was asked, do I strain or sieve this? And yes, I definitely do that. Uh, I take a lot of care making sure that's um, real nice and smooth. And even if I haven't used it for a couple of weeks, sometimes I'll run it through a, I got a power mixer. Just trying to get a nice even layer on there. Now there's any number of tools that I can use for this last step. I'm going to use this metal rib. And I'm just going to wave this. I'm going to hold it against the edge of this slip here. I'm going to move it up and down while the, while the wheel is spinning. And you'll see what happens. And depending on how fast the wheel is going or um, what music is playing, it'll, uh, it'll give me some good stuff. Now I'm going to clean up all that, that bottom edge. This is a piece of chamois. Smooths the rim. Clean that up a little bit. So that's still a simple mug form, my usual warming up in the studio. And normally I'd pick the bat off, but there's kind of a bat shortage, so. Uh... Normally I wouldn't do that. Let's make it something bigger now. I'm noticing as I'm centering, there's a little bit of lumpiness in this clay. I didn't wedge and knead it enough. Or maybe it's just dried out just in the 10 minutes it's been sitting here. Um, I think I can power through it, but we'll, uh, we'll see if I pay for that later. If you're watching an experienced thrower and you're trying to learn as much as you can, you want to watch the, what the, every little thing they do with their hands. Because right there, I did this thing where I, I did this. I was taking the slip that was collecting in my palm and adding it back on the surface so I don't have to make a trip to get water. And that slip lasts longer than water as far as lubrication goes. So there's that and right there. I got that slip for the downward pass. Okay. There's the bullseye. Going down to find the, the right depth, again, quarter inch. 
opening the bottom. On that first piece, I did those two as separate, but this normally I combine them. The clay really wants to spread out because of the centrifuge action of the wheel. So the first thing I'm doing with almost every form as I establish this cylinder leaning in. It's easy to spread it out later. It's very difficult to bring it back in later. Yes, uh, porcelain remembers how it's formed. Definitely. So for most things, you don't have to worry about it too much, but when you're combining things, uh, spouts onto teapots, there's other situations where it's, yeah, it's real important. I love how that feels. Nice. Nice pull. The clay feels good. This is the, as I said, it's the Mount Hood porcelain. And uh, it's a real nice throwing clay body. You notice what I did right there? I kind of cut underneath. That just helps me to get at this clay at the bottom, which is when you're learning to throw, it's really hard to get all that up and you end up with heavy walls in the bottom of your pieces. That just allows me to get my knuckle under it. I'm not going to pull it up though. I'm going to push it in first and then pull it up. If you pull it up right away, it comes up and it forms a wave and then it'll rip off because slip will get underneath it. So you got to push it in first, then pull it up. I think I've got one more pull. Um, this is a shaping pull. So instead of just going for this cylinder, I decided right there in the moment, I don't know why, that I was going to make a, a kind of a bellied out form. Uh, I think because it would be more dramatic. As the piece gets taller and thinner walled, really good idea to slow the wheel down a little bit so it doesn't fling it apart. That's called setting the rim. I'm liking that. Um, I think I've got most of the clay pulled up into the walls. Time again for my favorite tool. Using a rib does a couple things for you. One, it smooths the surface. It allows you to shape it, and this, this flexible metal rib will just kind of, no matter how you bend it, it'll form a graceful curve because of the nature of its uh, bendability. And I'm also compressing the walls and drying the walls so I can be a little more aggressive with the shaping. I like the shape to be 
right on the edge of where it's going to collapse. It's just there's something exciting about that that narrow little window. Um, Uh, yeah, the question was asked, am I thinking about the ratio and the, s the scale of these two parts? We, we talk about form, right? So there's this belly part, which is dominant, and then this is the neck or the rim. The rim. And there's definitely a golden mean or in there, three to one or five to one or somewhere in there. But at this point, for me, it's intuitive. I. I, I incorporated that somewhere along the line. Uh, I find this transition right here to be really important. And I've got a little divot in there that's, I'm not going to leave there. I'm pressing up underneath. I'll never get tired of making these just these round vessels. They're so much fun. I use glazes that are um, that react to to interruptions in the surface. And this is a Temoku glaze, it's black black where it's thick and brown where it's thin. And it'll, the glaze, when it melts, pulls away from the high points. That red and yellow one, that glaze is, is red when it's thin and yellow where it's thicker. And when I dip it, the glaze catches on the top of the ridge of the slip and, and just ends up being a little thicker. So I like to have something on the surface for the glaze to interact with. In this case, I didn't use the slip, I just Use the edge of my pinky to put a little texture in there. Let's see what kind of uh, slip texture I can get on this form. I just mentioned I like to take these forms and spread them out right to that point where they're, they're threatening to collapse. There's been a few occasions where I've added the slip and then I walk away an hour later, the thing is slumped flat on the bat because the moisture from the slip soaked into the clay. And anyway, uh, but I'm able to laugh about it. Uh, certainly it's. Uh, this, I'm, I'm shooting this slip kind of onto the brush. That helps push it onto the surface. Otherwise, a lot of it would kind of drip off as I was going. I'm just going to put a little bit thicker layer on this one. Oh, the the thicker slip will um 
just make much more pronounced uh, ridges that'll show up better. It's kind of a, interesting. There's a rhythm. I make a batch of this, and the, when I make the original batch, it's a little watery. Then every time I go to the studio, it settles out, and there's a little bit of water, and I pour it off. So as I'm going along through that batch of slip, it's getting thicker and thicker. And um, So I like what it does. If it's thinner, I do some other things. I'll show you what I do with when it's a little runnier. I've already lost one of my tools. Ah, yeah, there it is. Thank you. This is a regular metal rib. This rib, I took a rat-tailed file, and I cut some grooves in it. And you'll see what that does. Because really, I'm using the edge here. The slip sneaks around the edge. But this one's going to have a secondary line that's going to show up. Got to get centered here. I like it. You see that secondary line that the little divot in the rib leaves? The, one of the fun things about working with wet slip on wet clay, if I don't like it, Where'd my, where'd my, there we go. Oh, let's try this one. Oh, huh. weird. Okay. Yeah. Wide, stiff bristle brush. This one also has a notch cut in it. So you see how different that is, but kind of like that one too. Uh, I'm going to call that one done. This would be uh, dried to leather hard, flipped over, and the bottom would, would be trimmed so that curve would carry all the way down to the bottom. The base would be fairly narrow. It would look uh, kind of light or uh, floating a little bit. That's the idea anyway. Well, let's make something bigger. The question was asked, what glaze is this? This is a, a, a strontium satin glaze with a little iron, makes it yellow. This is Shaner's Red, which is a recipe that I got, I tried for the first time 
48 years ago, the first school I was at, and I loved it. It was my favorite glaze. It was actually at my high school. I went to the four-year school. I, I mixed up the recipe. Didn't work. It requires a certain feldspar called Kingman feldspar, and the mine had closed down. You couldn't get it anymore. So literally, since then, for like 45 years, I've been trying to get this glaze to work, and I've found a bucket of Kingman Feldspar recently, and I tested it, and I'm extremely happy about the, the Shaner's Reds I'm getting. To get a, um, an iron red that's, that's really red like that, and it's also got a luscious surface, it's not shiny like copper reds, it's just, but thanks for asking, Shaner's Red. That Kingman Feldspar he has reserved for uh, just that glaze. Should I do a bowl or an altered form? Tall altered form? Big bowl. Let's try that. I've taught a lot of people how to throw in my teaching job uh, over the years, and I always stress the importance of this clay prep, because I ignored my first teacher, because I thought that was the fun part, and I would like, I was working away for weeks or months maybe, and I couldn't make anything, and then I said, oh, I'm going to humor the instructor, and I wedged the, and kneaded the clay 50 times, I made three pieces that day. So anyway, uh, okay. It was fun to watch. Uh, the large pot demonstration. If some of you saw that, he was wedging the, he was centering his clay and he started at the top. It's like, oh, cool, I, uh, I do it that same way. So I'm going to be, this isn't a big, really big piece, but I'm going to use that same technique where if you got a big piece of clay and it's kind of more than your muscles can handle. You bring it up a little bit, you can just center the top part. Just work on that part that's a more manageable size. Then go down a little bit and grab a little more clay. See how that works? And then I'm working my way down. Doing that, I can skip that part where you're getting jostled around. Fortunately, this is still in my, my range of my muscles. I've got to be careful not to trap any water or slip under here. So you notice I stopped short of going all the way to the bat. Now I'm going to make a big bowl. And that's a form that where you're really stretching the clay out a lot. So any out of centeredness gets exaggerated. So I'm going to, I could work with this, but I'm going to go up and down one more time so I don't look so out of control later. It's also the hardest place to get the clay centered is right here at the bottom. So you'll see near the end of any of my centering passes, I do this kind of aggressive push right there. If 
Okay. Now for bowls, I like to make my bowls. I leave clay in the bottom to trim a foot, a tall foot. So with these two, I went down to where the clay was just a quarter inch thick. So I, I don't need to trim up underneath there. But for the bowl, I'm going to leave that extra clay. So I got to remember that so I don't just go, oh, I'm happy. I'm going down and go down too thin. So I got to stop. And I'm probably uh, that thick down there. Oh, good. Thank you. Shall I test the thickness? What am I doing wrong? Who's going to... Got to stop the wheel. I was just seeing if you're paying attention. So you see all that clay. Plenty of clay in there. Now, the, the next thing that's different on a bowl, these I pulled the bottom flat. The bowl I want to be a graceful curve. So that starts in the bottom. So when I pull this bottom open, I'm going to be swinging like a pendulum. And I'm using the, the edge of this finger, backed up by his two best friends, for support. So you can't see that, maybe it's on the camera, but it's about that kind of curve down there. Now because of all that extra clay that I left in the bottom, I've got to be really thorough about knitting that clay back together. So I I learned that the hard way. I think probably the first time I was like, I'm going to make some big bowls and I make, I used to make four or six pieces in a series or more if it was smaller things, but I made four or six big bowls for the first time and they all cracked in the bottom. Uh, so now I'm really thorough about making sure that I push that clay back together. I'm also refining the shape. Now I'm going to slow this down a little bit. With making bowls, there's this fine line between pulling the clay up and st stretching it out. And if you stretch it out too soon and then you try to thin it, it collapses. If you bring it up too high before you try to stretch it out, you stretch it out and it gets its really weak. It tears, rips. So there's kind of a sweet spot in there. And you're going to have to prepare yourself to leave some clay in the bottom to support it that you're going to trim away later. I'm starting my pull now at the outside edge of that curve that I created when I opened the bottom. It's easy to dig down and lose that continuity. Mostly I'm pulling up. But I'm also letting it letting it expand the way it wants to. Right now I have this double rim. Sometimes I would leave that. That's kind of cool. But I'm going to sh show you something else with the slip. So I'm not going to need this kind of rim. So I'm going to I'm going to disappear that. I was, I call it surrounding it, and then, then I was kind of putting pressure here. Uh, yeah, I don't want to trap any slip in there, exactly. Yeah, you got to be careful about that. Of course, the, 
the wider the piece gets, the faster it's going. So you got to slow the wheel down a little bit, or at least I do. There's going to be that one last pull where you really get a lot of it and then you can't do much to it after that. I think I'm one pull away from that. I did that undercutting thing so I can get my knuckle under that. That one felt good. I do like making bowls. Thank, thank you for requesting. I have a very small gas kiln, and it, it, um, to fire it well, it has a very certain kind of number of layers. Five inch layer in the bottom, two inch layer, five, and then the tall stuff. And so I don't make any plates because if, if I, when I fire plates and I have my shells real close together in the kiln, the kiln doesn't fire right. So it's funny, I've gotten a, I like to make plates, but I don't ever make them just because my kiln doesn't like them. <laughs> so, but it does like bowls. So I make a lot of bowls and I love using a really good, quality handmade bowl, whether it's mine or one of my potter friends. Now I'm going to do my last go for it pull here and see what happens. Um, I'll be shaping, but I will be doing some refining. I, uh, hopefully. We'll see. During the process of doing the last couple pulls, the I've lost the continuity of the curve in the bottom, so I'm going to try and get that back. And there's there's that taking it to the edge where it's it's threatening to flop. I'm a I'm about to probably use a rib. I don't always use a rib, but what I think is important and mostly aesthetically but also structurally is that the curve is continuous. Now most bowls. There's some where you you have a a change in shape, you might have a flat rim or something. That's cool. But if you have a bowl form that has a flat bottom and then has a kind of an angle and all the tension and the shrinkage is going to be aimed at that spot and you're more likely to get weird cracks but now I'm refining the curve the thing with bowls is you have to ignore the outside shape because I'm going to trim the out outside to match what's inside so I'm not I'm not even necessarily going to look at that outside shape I think I will use a rib on this one. I'm going to do something drastic now I don't usually do. I'm going to do one more pull. So, stay. Yeah, make sure your folks up front here, you might get splashed. 
I'm going to slow this wheel way down. You see how much that changed it. Hmm. I got away with it that time. Yeah. And I have still have that flowing curve that I really like. Now the slip. And I'm going to I'm going to lay this rim down so you can maybe see it better. Don't try that at home. Here we go. How am I doing on time? 2.46. Okay. Well, Stephanie's up next, right? She's great. Stephanie used to work in my studio for many years. She was a great studio mate. So I'm adding this, again, a nice thick layer of slip. Yes. I this was just pure luck. I had a student that was a vet. I got some syringes, you want them? I'm like wow. Again, I like ten years I was just doing this back and forth. I just that's the thing that makes me feel the most ashamed of my no, I'm kidding. <laughs> so I've got the slip on the inside. I don't know whether you can see it on the uh the camera or not, but I'm gonna I'm gonna do this by hand. Maybe this will go slow enough. Isn't that fun? This that fluidity of the clay. Now, I almost always clean it up. So, I'm going to, and you can help me, you know, you can decide for yourselves whether you like it better with the kind of the, the edges are uneven or we do this. kind of frame it up a little bit and same thing up here. So that's a big bowl or medium sized bowl depending on this. I'm going to demo just this real cool thing with black slip with the time I have left. I live in North Portland. And if you ever want to come see the studio and all my pots, you just ring me up. I 
I've never done one of these particular technique with a piece of clay this big. This should be interesting. I haven't been throwing for probably a month because um, I was in the glazing phase, finishing my pieces for the show. And uh, I'm taking a songwriting class, so I had homework every week. But um, it feels, feels good. Uh, I'm taking an online songwriting class from Matt Meehan. He's fantastic. Mean is M-E-I-G-H-A-N. And uh, the one positive thing from the pandemic, when everything went on to Zoom, is there are people in this class from New Zealand and Minnesota and just anywhere. It's, it's really pretty amazing. If you go to my website, richiebellinger.com, you can see my pottery, you can listen to some of the songs I've written and recorded, and you can see some of the photos I take. I, I like to take photo safaris. I get in my car and I just drive up some, try to find a road I haven't been on, looking for beautiful things to photograph. And... Um, I grew up in Illinois where all the roads are in a grid and it's impossible to get lost because you're either going south, north, or east. Anyway, Oregon's quite fun that way, but I've, I've pretty much exhausted the, the new roads, except for soon here I'm going to go out to the Owyhee, the southeast, very so far southeast corner of Oregon because I haven't been out there yet. Okay. There are so many fun things you can do with clay. This show is a great example of that, right? And you can see so many different way, forms of personal expression, whether it's hand building, wheel, surfaces, temperature, color, uh, content and it, just do with the wheel people there's no two people doing the same thing it's wonderful when uh, as a teacher you see your students learning to get the basic skills down and then they reach a point where their individual they get enough skill to where their individual ideas uh, and visual elements start to show up and it's always a very exciting part of the process I'm just going to make a tall cylinder. Why do I want to use white clay? Good question. The white clay, when my glaze melts on top of it, the glazes are brighter. But the stoneware which has iron or the color in most clay is iron, it'll it'll make the glazes more earthy. Kind of it's just a little dark grayer or something. I do some stoneware. The other reason I use white clay is because when I'm doing the slip patterns, white slip on white clay, I don't have to worry about going through. If I'm using stoneware and I, I go through in some spots to where I'm down to the gray clay, sometimes that's kind of awkward. As it is, I just get the pure texture. Does that make sense? Yeah, easier to clean the studio. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll be quick.
So I've got this cylinder. I'm going to dry the surface. This is just a black slip. This is white. This is going to be total contrast. Question was asked, uh, do I fire a cone 10? And yes, I fire, fire a cone 10 in reduction. I call myself a cone 10 reduction snob. I, I, the school I was teaching at, we had electric and a bisque electric. Yeah. Now you can do amazing things with. Um, oxidation and cone six and low fire. It's such a wonderful medium that way. Okay. It's very hard for me to relax my craftsmanship instincts, but I need to in this format. I'm just gonna cut through that layer So you see what I've got there? Now the trick is to get my hand inside that without dripping any water down the outside. That's why I didn't want to describe it. So, so that's, that's one pull. Shall I try another one? Yeah, I'm confident. That's a little trippy watching that go by. Whoa. Anyway, that's about it for me. Thank you. Again, thank you for, for uh, watching and, the, and excellent questions.